prayers. Uh, and We would certainly covet your prayers in the weeks ahead. Well, if you have your Bibles, I would invite you to take them out to 1 John. As you know, today is Palm Sunday. Uh, we're going to be continuing in 1 John this morning. I'll be addressing a few things with Palm Sunday at the end of my message this morning. But we're in 1 John chapter 4, and I'm going to be reading verses 1 through 6. If you don't have a Bible, that's okay. You can just listen in or just uh, see the words there on your screen. Once again, we want to welcome all, the, all those you, you that are tuning in this morning. 1 John chapter 4, verse 1 says this, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you will know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, and every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist which you have heard was coming and is now in the world already. Little children, you are from God and have overcome them, for he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are from the world, therefore they speak from the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us, and whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Let's pray and ask the Lord's blessing on this time. Lord, we thank you for your word. We pray, Lord, today that by your Holy Spirit that you would guide us into truth. And Lord, you would give us the gift of discernment. Lord, we need you. And we ask, Lord, that as we navigate life, that you would give us and grant us this gift. Holy Spirit, be our guide. We ask for your blessing on this time. Give us our hearts to receive and ears to hear today. We pray and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, growing up uh, in our family, nobody uh, hunted. Uh, so it was really never a part of my life as far as going out. It's a big thing in Michigan where I grew up, but our family, we just never did it. And it wasn't until I was in my 30s and living in Minnesota that I went hunting for the very first time. Uh, a few of the guys in our church invited me to go goose hunting with them. And uh, there was, a, few, uh, uh, there was a, a field a few miles outside of town that was the perfect spot for us to set up. And so about 5.30 that morning, we all got up and, and marched out to the field and set up a number of the different decoys that would attract these Canadian geese. And several of the guys also had some flutes where you could call the geese and uh, they actually let me use them. It was fun to do that, actually. Honestly, that was the most entertaining time of my time, you take it, honking around all morning, <laughs> trying to attract these geese. Uh, we didn't have much luck that morning, uh, probably because I didn't do a very good job. <laughs> I think there's a correct way to do it, and I wasn't doing it the right way. But either way, they put up with me. But that was my only time going goose hunting. And uh, it was a great time together. Uh, but if you think of it, Hunters use those decoys to trick the birds into thinking that they're real geese on the ground. Uh, the flutes are also used to mimic uh, the sounds that the birds make. It deceives them. And if actually done successfully, unlike my honking, uh, the geese are easy prey uh, because they are attracted to those sounds. You know, it's interesting, as Christians, there are many roving, you could say, decoys out there, and their job is to kind of extricate us from the intimate experience of truth. Uh, we must look beyond sometimes what just the person says and really how they perform to determine their authenticity and their faith in Jesus Christ. We must evaluate and test the spirits, as John mentions here in this passage. We must be on guard for decoys, as it were, moving all around us, acting like the real thing in order to deceive. As Christians, we need discernment. Amen to that? We need discernment today. Uh, with all the easy access that we have uh, these days on the internet and blogs and and videos, and podcasts, as well as TV, and books, and countless other resources that are really at our disposal, we need to be able to discern things correctly. We need to be able to tell the truth versus th those things that are, are, are lies. 
You know, the, the definition of discernment is the ability to make a smart and accurate judgment about something. We need to make good judgments as Christians. We need to understand things clearly. We need to understand what God's Word says. And we need to know how to discern the times and the people around us. We need to be able to tell the difference between what is right and what is wrong. And know the difference between truth and error. And I say, God help us. Uh, because there's a lot of things that we're being bombarded with every day. So the question I want to ask this morning is, how do we know if something is truly of God? How do we know if something is truly of God? And actually, John gives us some very helpful guidance here in this passage. Let's return once again to verse 1. He says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. So basically, what John does here is he provides two commandments. One's a negative command and one's a positive command. The negative command is he says, don't believe every spirit. Don't believe everything you hear. Don't be gullible. Uh, just because it's popular doesn't mean that it's truth. Just because it's spoken eloquently doesn't mean that it is right. You know, you, we saw what, was, what happened in Germany there. We, we heard the missions report. But this past week, I was actually looking into some of the history of Germany in World War II, and I discovered a video online of a speech of Adolf Hitler that he gave. And what was interesting is, is, is because of artificial intelligence. Now, there's a lot of complications with that uh, these days, and we're kind of, this is a whole new thing that for all of us we're trying to process. But because of AI, the speech was able to be translated into English using his voice likeness. It was actually quite remarkable to hear. And I've always thought of Hitler as a madman, and he is, he was, and he was certainly an evil man. But what I found when I listened to this speech was actually quite disturbing. He was actually quite well, he was well spoken. He spoke very eloquently. He was passionate, obviously. But he was eloquent. His vocabulary was actually quite astounding. Yet it was poison. And it affected millions of lives across Europe and around this world. What that tells me is that some of the most dangerous people are those who come off as charismatic in personality or eloquent in speech. But their words, if we don't discern them correctly, are dangerous. And this is certainly true in the political world. But it's also true, as John is pointing out here this morning, that it's true in the spiritual world as well. And so, Clayhouse, we cannot judge a minister, a teacher, or an evangelist on the basis of the crowds that follow them. This is not discernment, and really true discernment is, is really not determined by how many likes a person has on their online post. We need to be discerning this way. John 8, 44, Jesus says, Satan is the father of lies. It's interesting, the Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen that the devil can appear as an angel of light. And so we need to be alert. And John would be reminding us today as he did those, the, that congregation there, don't believe every spirit out there. That's the negative command he gives. But the positive command, he says, is test the spirit. Do, don't do that. Don't believe everything you hear. But do test the spirit. Be discerning. You know, the Greek word, uh, dokomazo, means to prove, examine, or try. So be able to examine it. Thoroughly investigate. Try what you hear. Let it sift through your thinking and through the, the Spirit's guidance. As you're able to receive this information, trust that, that the Holy Spirit will guide us and guide you. Why? Because false teaching and teachers are out there. So beware of the false teaching. Because it's possible, as all of us know, to be deceived. And tragically, often the nearer a lie is to the truth, the more deceitful it is. And I also want to say, beware of people who provide maybe good teaching in the wrong spirit. And I would say this is probably an area that some of us really need to pay attention more to. 
there's two sides, you could say, of discerning the truth. There's certainly the doctrinal side of things, which is critically important, that we understand what the Scriptures say and understand how we are to... Uh, this, what, what the teaching is being taught, how we are to process that, whether or not it is in alignment with Scripture. There's the, the sound doctrine side of things. But the other side is the spirit of a person. Are they preaching with the right spirit? Now, while many of us are good at discerning, you could say, sound doctrine versus false teaching, maybe some of us aren't so good at discerning the spirit by which the preacher speaks from. And this is where deception can happen because we need to discern not only the teaching, but we need to discern, are they speaking from a proud spirit? Are they speaking from a jealous spirit or self-righteousness? You know, I've known some ministries over there that when it comes to maybe some of the issues of doctrine, you can check the box and say, yes, that sounds good, that sounds correct. But they have a critical spirit. This is almost as if these preachers salivate when another ministry is destroyed. They enjoy calling out everyone else's failures but their own. Corey Tim Boone said it this way. She said, discernment is God's call to intercession, never to fault finding. And I'll say this. One of the, thing, one of the dangers I will say, because obviously we would all understand the need for sound doctrine, and that absolutely is critical. But we need the Spirit's guidance in these matters as far as the listening to the Spirit of the one who's speaking. Because if they have a critical spirit and we're regularly listening to them and that receiving that diet of their teaching, it's possible that we could pick up the same spirit. And this is why we need discernment these days. Now, it's one thing to be discerning. It's another thing to have that kind of critical spirit. Because I will say it's possible to be right and wrong at the same time. Galatians, Paul says this in chapter 5, verses 14 and 15. For those, for, for, for those, for the, those who the law is fulfilled in one word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But Paul says, but if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. So again, there are many people today that even, you would say, well, they have sound doctrine, but they, they're always biting and do devouring other people. Now, yes, there are times to take a stand and there are times to call out specific errors and teachings. But if this is the whole pattern of your ministry, be careful. Titus 3, 9 says, But avoid foolish controversies, genealogies, dissensions, and quarrels about the law, for they are unprofitable and worthless. So when, we, when it comes to this issue of discernment, we not only need to understand, and we're going to talk about how to discern God's truth and how do we understand that from the lies that are out there, but we also need discernment in understanding the difference between what you would call a first-tier issue versus those things that you might consider a second-tier or third-tier issue. And the, quite, the issue for me of deciding whether or not a, it's a first-tier issue is if I believe this belief, will it keep me out of heaven? Now, there are a lot of other issues that we, we would consider second- or third-tier issues because those are, while important for us to talk about, they aren't issues critical to salvation. And this is important for us to have discernment as well, that we need to... It, it, on those critical issues, those tier one issues, stand strong, be firm, and those are hills worth dying on, as it were. But when it comes to other issues, yes, there's a point for discussion or debate or, or you know, interaction regarding that, but understand that it might just be a difference that we have on those second or third tier issues. Again, this is an area of discernment that we need to have to be able to tell what is critical to the essentials of the faith. What is critical to our salvation? And so John says here, test the spirits. Not just what is said, but it, how it is said. Turn with me, if you will, again, you'll see the words on your screen, to a story that we find in Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16, verses 16 through 18. Uh, Paul and Silas were, do, were, were in ministry, and they were traveling as missionaries. And it says, as we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune-telling. She followed Paul and, and us, crying out, these men are servants of the Most High God, 
who proclaimed to you the way of salvation. And this she kept doing for many days. Paul, having become greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. Now, I want to just pause for a second. What that girl spoke was, was the truth, wasn't it? I mean, they, Paul and Silas were servants of the Most High God, and they were proclaiming the way of salvation. The discernment was on a, wasn't on the issue of sound doctrine here. It was on the issue of the spirit that was being manifested in her. She spoke the truth, but in the wrong spirit. Now, the undiscerning today, she would be a prophetess in the church. But it was demons that were influencing her. And so when we, when we talk about the issue of discernment this morning, many of us immediately go to the sound doctrine issue, and that is critical. But we also need to discern the spirit that is being manifested in the one who is speaking. And this is where some of us have been burned in the past by spiritual leaders, maybe because we saw some things in the spirit of that person that wasn't right, but they speak sound doctrine. So how do we know if something is of the Holy Spirit or someone is of the Holy Spirit? Let's return once again to 1 John chapter 4, verse 2. It says, By this you will know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. Now you remember last week we talked about uh, how the Spirit of God who dwells and dwells true followers of Jesus testifies to the fact that that we are children of God. We have this inner witness that we are born again as the Spirit of God gives us by, this, by God's grace. Yet the Holy Spirit also helps us discern those who are not walking according to God's light. Those led by the Spirit will confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh from God. Now, just to kind of step back and give us a little bit of a context here to this, uh, the, this, the, the folks that John is writing, is that they were, had just been influenced by false teachers. And these false teachers that were there for a period of time, and by this point, as John was writing them, had taken off, they had denied Jesus' humanity. In other words, they had denied the incarnation of Jesus Christ. And so when John is speaking specifically to them, he's saying, look, these false teachers are of the Antichrist, this evil and false spirit, because they've denied the humanity of Christ, they've denied his incarnation. And so they taught what was, you would refer to as a false Christology. And they may lay claim, as they say, to spiritual inspiration. But John is saying they're not of the Holy Spirit. They've denied the true teachings of who Jesus was and is, that he came in the flesh and he was from God. And so John is telling them, he's saying, the mark of true inspiration is confession that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. And here's the point, just to kind of step back for application for us. The Spirit of God inspires valid confession of Jesus. Let me say that again. The Spirit of God inspires valid confession of Jesus. You know, if you're interacting with your neighbors or friends or family, coworkers, people that aren't walking with Jesus, or maybe they are in some type of a cult or some type of a false kind of belief system. And so one of the things that's critical is to get back to who Jesus is. Let's talk about Jesus. What do you believe about Jesus? And, and be, be discerning on these matters. The Spirit of God inspires a valid confession of Jesus. And every spirit that bears false witness to Jesus uh, that does not derive from God. These false teachers made these false claims which revealed that they were not from God. And so we need to be discerning about what people say about Jesus and who He is. And Jesus actually warned of false Christs and prophets. For example, Matthew chapter 24 and verses 24 and 25, he says, For false Christs and false prophets will rise and perform great signs and wonders so as to lead many astray, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand. It's interesting, as we see in the scriptures, we can see that it has a lot to say about evil spirits. Now, we don't want to get uh, over 
uh, focused on these demonic evil spirits because as Christians, we, we know that we have double coverage. If a third of the angels fell from heaven, it means that two-thirds are still on our side. So we have double coverage. We don't need to give overemphasis on them, but nor should we deny the work of the enemy in our midst. And the scriptures tell of evil spirits or unclean spirits. And actually, we see in 1 Kings 22, lying spirits. We need to be discerning of this, friends. We have to be on high alert to these forces of darkness that influence people. And dare I say, even influence those that we would consider spiritual leaders today. You know, years ago, during the gold rush, uh, some people discovered fool's gold. How do you know if you have the real thing? Well, you submit it actually to an acid test. True gold will not dissolve when tested with nitric acid. And so the acid test of truth is whether it is confirmed to script, whether it conforms to, to Scripture, that the Bible is our absolute standard of truth. Amen to that? The Bible is our absolute standard of truth. Hebrews 4, uh, verse 12, the author says this, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and inter interactions of the heart. So the Bible is authoritative, but it's living and active. This means that God, by His Spirit, allows His Word to speak to us. This is not just the historical book. It contains historical facts. But nonetheless, we have to understand that by God's Spirit, He takes the truths of God's Word and can change our lives. It's living. It's active. There's salvation as we believe the words of Scripture and the words of Jesus. The prophet Jeremiah, chapter 23, verse 29, says, it, the Lord says, Is not my word like fire, declares the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks the rock to pieces. I don't know if you've ever had a time where you've read God's word and there was just something that God just convicted you on in a certain thing where it just, it's like a hammer crushing a rock. You just realize, oh, yeah, pride is there in me and my response, how I dealt with this situation or whatever it may be. God's word is powerful like that because it is the spirit of God that takes the promises of God and the challenges that we see in scripture toward, to us to live in holiness, to convict us, to draw us to Jesus. But the Bible is our standard of truth. It is powerful, it is living, and it is active. Joseph Benson says, we are to try all the spirits by the written word. And this is why we must do, as Paul charges Timothy to do, to study the scriptures, to show ourselves approved. So if we want to grow in our ability to discern things, particularly in the area of sound doctrine, we need to study the scriptures. We need to understand what God's word says so that we're able to sort of do that acid test, as it were, to see if it's real gold or false gold, fool's gold. How do we discern? We go to God's word. John continues once again in 1 John chapter 4, verse 3. He says, And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now in the world already. And he talked about the spirit of Antichrist earlier in his letter. We actually shared about this whole subject matter about a month ago. But he makes it very clear that the Holy Spirit will confess Jesus. And a person who is led of the Spirit will testify to Jesus correctly. And those who are not of the Spirit of Christ will deny that He is the Christ. The Christ meaning the Messiah or the Savior. Oliver Green said it this way, Oh yes, there are many who are considered great teachers, great preachers, and even evangelists who say a lot of nice things about Jesus. They declare that he was unique, extraordinary, and the most unusual man who ever lived. They confess that he was a great teacher, a great healer. But a person can believe all those things about Jesus and still be lost and eternally damned when they depart this life. To believe that Jesus was a great man is not enough. You know, Clay House, if Jesus was not the divine Son of God then he was history's greatest hoax. 
And so what John is saying is, yes, we have to affirm Jesus' humanity, that he came in the flesh, his incarnation, yet we must also affirm his divinity. We must also affirm that he is the Messiah, the Savior, the Son of God, the only way to God. And so John is saying a person of the Spirit of of Jesus must have this right confession of him, that he is the only way to God. Peter, as he's preaching to the crowds in Acts chapter 4, verse 12, he says, And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now, based on Peter's confession there, we know that he was speaking of the Holy Spirit because he affirmed the divinity of who Christ is. He affirmed what Jesus' purpose was and is to be a Savior. But we also have to understand that this right confession must also be followed by right action. And this is also John's a big point of why he's writing this congregation. And the truth is, hear me well, the problem with most people is not finding the truth, but facing it. Many people reject truth today simply because they don't want to confront their own sin. They want their lifestyle and behavior to remain the same. And John is saying, look, if you have a a, a transforming encounter with a risen Savior, this will reshape your life. You will be transformed, not just in your beliefs. Yes, certainly there. But out of that will flow a lifestyle of obedience to God. Jesus says, for example, in Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. I'll tell you, if there's sobering words in the Scripture, that's, those are certainly some of them. Jesus says, Luke, in, in Gospel of Luke, in chapter 6, verse 46, he says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? So the question we have to ask ourselves before we're able to discern correctly other people around us, first of all, is your Jesus the real Jesus? And secondly, if you believe right, are you obeying him? John is saying there is a necessity to obey Jesus' commandments, to walk in love. And this is how we know we are of the truth, as we talked about even last Sunday. So if one does not have this type of confession, John is saying they are of the Antichrist. And when we talk about that, as I referenced about a month ago, we're not just talking about the Antichrist. We're talking about a spirit that is present even in this world today. It was present in John's day. It's present today. The spirit that does not acknowledge Christ. The spirit that is against Christ. That is already in the world today. And my friends... That spirit of Antichrist is on blog posts, it's on TV screens, it's in books we read, it's all over the place. Can we discern this? And I would say, without the Holy Spirit, we can't. But because if we are truly born of the Spirit of God, we, He will give us the grace to discern not just what is said, but the Spirit by which it's said in the first place. Because the Spirit of Antichrist is the polar opposite of Jesus. And as a result, many are given over to lies. Somebody once said that a, a lie is like a snowball. The further you roll it, the bigger it becomes. There are many in churches today, many preachers, and yes, some entire organizations and denominations that have been given over to the spirit of Antichrist, given over to lies. And my friends, we aren't exempt from this possibility of deception ourselves. So, what's the point? It's time we sober up. It's time we sober up as parents. 
What kind of things are we allowing into our homes that our kids are watching or listening to? It's time we sober up as grandparents or sober up as singles. What are, what are things we watching on YouTube or other places? And John here is really speaking like a father. Look what he says in verse 4. He says, little children. He says, kids, basically, you are from God and have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. He's saying, you Christians are from God and have overcome this spirit of Antichrist. It's interesting, he uses the past tense here, that they have already, or we have already overcome. This has already happened. Victory has already been won for us. And this is something we have to remind ourselves, that Jesus Christ has overcome this world, and he has given us the victory if our faith and trust is in him. And as a result of that, we are temples of the Holy Spirit, and the Spirit of God will give us the ability to discern what is being said and the Spirit by which is being said to Him. Greater is He, the Spirit of Christ within you, than He who is in the world, the Spirit of Antichrist. That God is greater than the devil and all the demons of hell combined. Hallelujah to that. That demons believe, James says in chapter 2, verse 9, demons believe and they tremble. Jesus says, for example, in John 16, 13, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak of his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will declare to you the things that are to come. So the spirit of God guides us into truth. He guides us. He helps us and he shows us things that are necessary for our salvation and for our journey of faith. As Christians, we have this spirit of truth within us. And so therefore, we don't have to fear. Now, we do need to be sober. We need to be alerted to what is going on around us, but we don't have to fear. Amen to that? We don't have to be, be afraid and, and cower in the corner because we know the power of God within us. By contrast, look at verse 6. He says, I'm sorry, verse 5, look at he says, John adds, he says, they are from the world, therefore they speak from the world, and the world listens to them. So when he says, these false teachers that were in that congregation, he's saying, look, they're from the world. They speak from the world and to the world. And these false teachers preach to please the world. And the world listens. Why? Because unbelievers and hypocrites cannot endure sound doctrine for more than a short time. Then the demons within them declare war on God's preacher. And those who deny Christ show that they belong to this world and that they're not from God. So John is saying, look, you need to be alerted, congregation. And I would say the same for us today. We need to be alerted to these realities. We need to, just because it has a lot of likes on YouTube or some other place, just because it's on a, even a Christian TV program, we need to be discerning. He says in verse 6, by contrast, we, unlike those false teachers, are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us, and whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we will know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. What he's saying is that we as Christians, we must confess Jesus properly. And whoever is from God listens to Jesus and listens to the truth. And whoever is not from God, he says, doesn't listen to us. Why? Because they have this spirit of Antichrist, the spirit of the world. And my friends, this is a call for each of us to speak up and share this truth of the gospel with other people. To talk about Jesus with them. To focus on the identity and nature of Jesus. We need discernment correctly. We need to discern things correctly as, as Christians. We must know truly if something or someone is of the truth. And so this is why discernment is so critical these days. Oliver Green said it again. He said it is important that, Christ, that the Christian be able to distinguish between the spirit of God and the spirit of error. For these ministers of the devil can speak words that will lead many to believe that they are, are ministers of the gospel. And Satan can quote more scriptures than most church members. And Sabbath so, Sabbath so most teachers of error know more about the Bible than many born-again believers know. They study to prove their points of error. 
whereas true believers study to feed our soul. I want us, as we think about what we're dealing with in our lives and the messages that we hear on a regular basis, I want us to be encouraged because we have a helper in this. We don't have to go at it alone. The Spirit of God will show us the spirit of error, the spirit of Antichrist around us. And so John really gives us two tests here in this passage. I've shared several of these, but just a recap. A two tests of tra- truth and falsehood. How do, we, how do we discern correctly? Number one, the confession that we make specifically of Christ, our confession of Jesus. And be discerning and be careful of what people are saying about who Jesus is and his purpose. And we need it, we, obviously, to discern if something is of the Spirit of God because of its, their confession of who Jesus is. And number two, our response to the message of the church, the gospel, to get back to the truth of the gospel. You know, today on this Palm Sunday, uh, we saw the kids as they were marching beautifully around the sanctuary singing songs and, and waving those palm branches. We were reminded of what happened as Jesus in that holy week as he rode into Jerusalem The people were waving their palm branches and they were putting their cloaks or coats in the road. It was was an expression of of celebration for a king coming in to enter. But as we know the rest of the story, what transpired through the week, many of those same folks that were exalting him or singing his praises in that Palm Sunday were shouting crucify him later in the week. And it just kind of brings it back to my attention, it should bring it to all of our attention, that when it comes to a valid expression of worship, yes, we need to honor Jesus Christ, and that is critically important, that we honor him completely. But the second thing is that we stay committed to worship, despite the changing tides of culture and popular opinion. My friends, there will come, and there may come a day in the days, in months or years ahead, where Preaching like this, even here in America, may be severely under attack. But my friends, we must worship Jesus, no matter if everybody else is doing it or nobody else is doing it. We must make the commitment in our heart to say, Jesus, I want my confession of you to be rich and true and sure. And I'm going to worship you no matter what. No matter if I have the freedom in this country to worship or I'm in another country and I don't have that freedom, I'm going to make the choice to stand for truth no matter what. My friends, circumstances change. God does not. And so therefore, as we try to discern what is going on in our times and discern how to navigate as individuals and families or as parents, we must always go to God and His Word But my friends, I would encourage you to seek the Holy Spirit. This isn't just words on a page, as I mentioned. His word is living and active because of the Spirit of God within us. And so I say, Holy Spirit, keep us in the truth. Keep us with a right confession of Jesus. And Lord, help us to walk humbly with you. And Lord, I pray that you would grant this church and each of us as individuals the gift of discerning of spirits. Lord, not only will we be committed to sound doctrine, yes, absolutely, but Lord, help us to pick up the spirit that is behind a person. God, grant us this. We need your help. We don't want to be deceived. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you stand to your feet? We're going to sing in closing, in closing, awakening. How many know that we need an awakening here in this country? Amen to that. We need an awakening. We need a revival. But my friends, this is going to happen as we stay committed to the truth and not waver to the left or to the right but stay committed to Jesus Christ in all things. So let's sing with all of our hearts and let's make this our prayer to God. Say, God, would you bring about an awakening? And Lord, first do it in me. Do it in me. That I might be transformed in your image and likeness in everything. Let's sing together.